Well, hey, good afternoon. I'm glad you made it today. Well done. You could be at the beach right now working on your tan, but you made it to the house of God. So proud of you for being at, o at Ocean's Church and being here today. And, uh, you know, last, last service was really special, but today I want to just uh, want to set the stage. We're starting a brand new series. Here at Ocean's Church, we do series. We believe that God still speaks. Anybody believe that? And when God speaks, we believe that he gives messages that are personal, but also messages that are for all of us. And the cool part is that everyone's going to see something different today. What you see online is a little different than what you experience in the front row, the side tents, the back. We are all a different vantage point. And the beautiful thing about the Word of God is that when someone gets up and teaches and preaches this book with boldness, God will speak to everybody in a unique way. And we're starting a new series today talking about master dreams. Say it with me, master dreams. I got this heavy download in prayer this week at our church. I want to encourage you to come out Tuesdays and Thursdays. It will change your life. We have pastors that come to our church that lead churches, and they're like, I didn't really know how to pray, like, corporately until I came to this church's prayer meetings. And I do believe it's very special, and one of the mandates, I think, for our church is to help other churches learn how to pray. Because the church is never going to be more dynamic on Sunday than it is during the week at its prayer meeting. And many of you feel a sweet presence in this tent. And I'll tell you why. It's because we've been praying all week. There is an overflow from Tuesdays and Thursdays that's just blowing into this tent. And every week is so powerful. But this week, I got this download, and God said, Mark, I want you to tell my people to get ready for my dreams. You see, what I want to tell you is, is that God is a God that will use dreams to elevate his people to lead the world out of famines. And if you look at Daniel and you look at, uh, I, mean, go down the, I go down the roster of famines in the Bible, prodigal sons, God used a famine to wake up the prodigal son. God used a famine to wake up the son that was lost in the church. The truth is, the more severe the famine, the more distinguished God can elevate his kids with dreams. Joseph was prepared for a dream that actually impacted the nations of the earth. And I have a word that I believe is for our church, but it's for the church. And here's the good news. It's actually for you personally. Because God is so beautiful that he can actually speak something directly to you personally and also speak something to all of us individually and, and corporately together. And so today I want to talk to you on the subject matter of master dreams. I believe the master has a dream for every one of us. Have you ever heard of a master lock or a master key? A master key has the ability to unlock all types of universal locks. And I believe there is something that God wants to do in this church that is a master dream that will actually be universal in some ways, meaning that we're, all of our dreams, they're specific, but they have the same purpose. I want you to catch that today, that God's dream for you is specific, but it also shares a, a universal purpose. It's evidence in the life of Joseph. Joseph spent 13 years from 17 to 30 getting prepared for the dream that God made him for. And during that season of preparation, and here's what I learned about God, whatever test you don't pass, God doesn't give you an F. He gives you a retake. I was always thankful growing up for the professors that gave me the retake. Some of you have, haven't passed the test in your 20s, and he won't fail you, but he will make you retake it in your 30s. Some of you are, are 70 years old, and you should have passed a test in your teens. And you keep retaking it over and over and over again. What I learned is wisdom doesn't travel with age. Sometimes age travels by itself. I've met 25-year-olds that are wise because wisdom comes from obedience. I feel like preaching a little bit today. When you obey the voice of God, it'll make you look good. And the Bible says it's the fear of the Lord, which gives you the ability to obey him. That leads to wisdom. So today, turn with me to Genesis chapter 37. Uh, this is going to be a series all on dreams. Dreams. Say it with me, dreams. It's going to be a few weeks long. I'm really excited about it. I'm going to try to get as much done as I can this service. But I have a lot to share. And what God told me was, is he said there is a purpose of dreams that I'm going to launch the church into. But before I can give them purpose, I have to prepare them for the dream. Are you hearing me today? Do you know that God has a big purpose for your life? And the truth is, it's not God's lack of ability to give you a big dream. It's your lack of ability to prepare yourself for the dream. I actually believe that Dallas Willard says it best when he says, one of God's hardest jobs is finding men and women whom he can entrust his power to. 
He went on to say that most of them that he gives power to end up destroying themselves and the people that they lead. Because the character is not there to sustain the call. That's why we have a litany of the Bill Cosby's of the world, the Tiger Woods of the world. I go down the roster of the Michael Fell, all these people of the world that had crazy gifts. We go through all of Hollywood, crazy gifts, but there was not a prepared character. Even in the church, crazy gifts. And I want to tell you today that I want to deal with this because I do believe that God says if there is a church committed to developing and preparing character, I will bring a dream that will change nations. I'll say amen to myself because I believe it. Genesis chapter 37. You guys ready to go? I want you to write this down before we get started today. Is uh, This is important that, that uh, there is a master dream that God has for your life. And what dreams do is God dreams set the boundaries that, that he'll cause you to grow into. What does that mean? God will give you a dream that will set the boundaries of what he'll let you or me or this church or this state grow into. You know, everybody thinks that something's crazy when someone dreams it. But when they get it done, they go, wow, we didn't think that was possible. You've all heard the story of Walt Disney when Disney World was actually opened. And, and, and Walt wasn't there at Disney World when it opened and his wife was being interviewed. And one of the engineers said, don't you wish Walt Disney was here to see this? In her response, Mrs. Disney said, he did see it. That's why it's here. The Bible says that without vision, without dreams, men perish. And I'll tell you right now, the world is not in chaos because it's, it's in chaos. I believe chaos is a result of men and women not having vision or dreams from God. Does that make sense? I believe Joseph's gift was diligence. He could bring order out of chaos. Order out of chaos. Actually, the worse the famine got, the more the crowds lined up. And I believe that God can enlarge your family, the grace, the gifts, the stewards, stewardship, the uh, resources, your business, that the greater the famine in the land, the more God can elevate you if you will allow him to prepare you. I want to talk to you today about prep time. Prep time. Genesis 37 verse 2. It says, this is the history of Jacob. Joseph being 17 years old. How old was Joseph? He was feeding the flock. What was he doing? Notice that God doesn't give dreams to people that are idle. First thing we know about him is he was feeding the flock. God let David slay Goliath when he was feeding his brothers. God called Moses when he was taking care of the sheep. God doesn't speak to people that are doing nothing. He blesses the works of our hands, not the, not the fantasies of our mind. I feel like preaching up in here today. Some of you want God to bless your imagination. No, God blesses your actions. Sitting around thinking about winning the lottery all day. Do something. Says this, that he was feeding the flock with his brothers. And the lad, I like saying the word lad, say lad. And the lad was the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah. I'm sure they were amazing women. Tough names though. His father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report to, the, to them about his, to his father. Israel loved Joseph more than all of his other children because out of 12 sons, he was number 11. He was the son of his old age. He actually made him a Michael Jackson tunic of many colors. That's not in there. That's, that's reader's emphasis. But when his brothers saw that his father loved Joseph more than all the other brothers, they hated him. They couldn't speak peaceably to him. Joseph had a dream. What did he have? 17 years old. He had a what? While he was feeding the flock, he had a what? And he told it to his brothers. And they hated him even more. So he said to them, please, guys, come here. Bring it in. I want to tell you this dream I had. There we were. Binding sheep. That sounds like a party. Binding sheaves in the field. And behold, my sheep arose and stood upright. Indeed, your sheep stood around all of mine and bowed down to my sheep. This is an awesome dream, right? And his brothers said to him, shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his, and for his what? It wasn't just his lofty dreams, it was his words. Then he dreamed still another dream. He didn't catch it because when you're 17, you're pretty clueless. Who remembers being 17? 
You thought you had the world figured out. You're like, I am an idiot looking back. He still dreamed another dream. He told it to his brothers and said, look, guys, I got a better one. Listen to me. Sit down. This time, I saw the sun. I saw the moon and the 11 stars. They bowed to me. They bowed to me. They bowed to me. Right? And it says, so he told it to his father and his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream that you've dreamed? Shall your brother and your brother and I indeed bow down before you to the earth? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept all these matters in his mind. Let's pray. God, we just love you today. I thank you for the people that you're going to heal today in this place. You told me there was someone that has deep trauma today, that a God dream can heal the trauma. You told me there's someone that lost their life's passion, and today a new light, good news, God news, God's dream is going to revive their spirit. Someone that's severely grieved and severely angry that, God, you're going to heal today in this place. I believe you're redeeming stories, restoring marriages, families, broken units, and today will be the beginning of God dreams that change families, neighborhoods, and I believe one day, nations. Prepare us for what's to come in Jesus' name. And someone with some faith, shout a good old-fashioned amen. I, uh, I like to cook. I grew up with two older brothers, I've told you before, and my mom did outside sales. And so I grew up as the little chef in the house. And uh, I thought at one point in my life, people asked, what did you want to do before you were a Christian? Well, first thing I wanted to do is I wanted to go to the military. I actually signed up uh, between services when I watched that video. Just enlisted to the Marines, I think, during that service. That video was so powerful. Come on, give God a hand clap for all the veterans today. Love you guys. So I signed up in high school for ROTC, and it, just, it didn't work out. I got kicked out in like 30 days. The major didn't appreciate my humor as much as I did. Did a lot of push-ups, though. And uh, got kicked out. But then I thought, you know what I want to do is I want to be a chef because I uh, like cooking. I would cook a lot for my, my brothers and my, my little sister, and I ended up, you know, cooking all the time. And so I don't know if you've ever been there before, but cooking's great. I enjoy home-cooked meals, but I just don't like the cleanup. Has anybody else, like, Thanksgiving, you ever notice this? Like, you make, like, 10 dishes of food, and there's, like, 78 pots and pans? Like, where did this all come from? We do Thanksgiving now with, like, those, like, plastic or, like, paper plates, we're like, forget the China. We just want to throw stuff away. You ever do that? My wife calls it Second Father's Day. Because they're the women and they're just like working away in the kitchen. We're all watching football. And they're just like, there's like this passive aggressive energy in our house. So I've learned, okay, if like I'm not the one cooking in the beginning, I'm cleaning afterwards. But I don't know what it is. There's something about preparing food that just takes a long time. I was thinking about food prep, you know. Food prep takes time. And uh, prep time is essentially defined as the amount of time it takes to prepare a recipe before cooking. Yeah. It's the amount of time that it takes to prepare a recipe. It's washing the vegetables. It's cutting the vegetables. I love making homemade salsa. It's one of my favorite things to do. But it takes me like, I don't know, three hours, and it costs $75 for a bowl. Yeah. I did the math one day. I'm like, man, I bought like, I don't know, $80 in ingredients and uh, anyways, prep time, prep time. And I was thinking about this. God is a master chef. Uh, he's actually a master chef. He would be like on, um, what's that show called? Uh, Chop. There's a couple. What was that one in the, the kitchen? Iron Chef? Who remembers Iron Chef? Come on, somebody. He's like Iron Chef. He could actually take the craziest, weirdest ingredients. I don't know if you're watching these shows like Chop. They're bringing out like, like raw squid and... They're bringing out, like, kale, which we all know that no one knew what kale was until 2010. I said this last service. The only people that knew what kale was was the Sizzler salad bar. Sizzler salad bar used kale not as food but as decor. Do you remember salad bar at Sizzler? It was, like, all the vegetables and kale, like a kale garden. Who remembers who remember Sizzler? Anybody remember Sizzler? They had that glass barrier to keep the germs off. You had to be double-jointed to reach your arm underneath to get the pineapple. <laughs> Ambidextrous. It was wild. I was thinking about this idea that, that God is a God that takes raw ingredients that looks like you could never make anything good with. And he makes these, like, gourmet, delicious, six-star dishes. 
He's the God of Romans 8, 28, that he will take the broken, the ugly, the bad, the maimed, the deception, the betrayal, the family dysfunction. He'll take divorce, affairs. He'll, he'll weaponize things that you never thought would ever taste good. I always tell people, I'm only here preaching before you because my dad and mom got divorced when I was seven. Did God cause the divorce? No. Did God use it? You better believe it. Who got the last laugh? Jesus Christ. Truth is, if dad didn't get a divorce, my mom, and my dad didn't relocate to Idaho, get remarried to his second wife who was going to Rochelle's dad's church, I never would have got saved at Capital Christian Center. I never would have got mentored by Chris Wilde. I never would have got ordained as a pastor from Ken Wilde. I never would have took the flyest woman on the planet off the market. Wouldn't have happened. But what does God do? He's a God that bends what's evil to our advantage. That's what he does. But the problem many times is, is God's ability to redeem is strong. Our ability to be willing to prepare sometimes is weak. The story's powerful because he's 17, tending flock when he gets a dream from God. 17. Has an audacious dream. It's a big dream. It's a dream that actually, here's what I know about God. Is God will actually show you what you need to see, even if it doesn't happen exactly like you saw it. I'll tell you, literally, he never saw Sheev's bow, never saw, never saw the sun, moon, and stars bow to him. But he saw what a 17-year-old insecure little boy needed to see. To stay motivated when he was in pits, to stay motivated and encouraged when he's in prison, to keep his mind sane when he was going through hell. I think the only reason that he didn't fold in the pit, only reason he didn't fold in the prison is because he held on to the God dream. I'm telling you right now, you can go through crazy, difficult things if you know you can get out of this. That's what Joseph did. Joseph had a dream. Someone say dream. Very important here we learn about Joseph is that, that dreams, again, they set the boundaries of the things that God causes us to grow into. So important because many times people don't re re realize this, that dreams require faith. If your dreams don't require faith, they're not from God. God dreams will always require, require his help. You can't do what God wants you to do without him. That's why God wants you to rely on him. Part of the reason why I believe Israel limped the rest of his life uh, after he had this encounter with God is because when you have a limp, you have to lean on somebody. And he wanted him to be leaning on him the rest of his life. We know that dreams are powerful. Martin Luther King Jr. had a, he had a dream. He had a dream. He said his speech was, I have a His dreams changed the social fabric of a nation. God dreams can change things. And this is a big part of the dreams. With God, the dream is never about you being great. Here's the master dream. The master is this. The master gives dreams that are not about making you great. They're about making a great difference to others. This is the heart of our Father. You being great is not the purpose of life. You helping other people while pursuing God is. So important because when you know who you are and you know what you're called to do, when you begin to dream with God, things can change drastically. Character destroys the foundation that dreams are built on. And I actually think most of God's dreams that are represented in this room are actually dying in the soil of entertainment and amusement. We are literally entertaining ourselves to death. We are so busy being entertained, so busy going to games, so busy watching shows, so busy just stimulating our minds by endless scrolling that we're not collaborating and cooperating with God's dream. <laughs> My friend told me a story about how he liked a, a biker show called The Sons of Anarchy. He said he watched all the seasons and he figured out that he spent 200 hours with a make-believe biker gang from Northern California. He said the thought occurred to him that if I spent the same amount of time writing and reading, I could actually write books that would touch the nations. So he changed. And I'm telling you right now that God will raise up men and women that are committed to being prepared for the dream. Hear me very clearly. This is not a works message that you have to actually earn your way to be used by God. God loves all of you. God has a dream for every one of you. It's a custom, tailor-fit dream. But just as God gives dreams freely, 
There is an element of your ability to be used by God that's determined about your ability to obey God's voice. He says, you are my friends if you do what I say. So God loves you no matter what, but his friends, his friends are the ones that actually listen to what he's telling them to do. And here's what I know about Joseph is Joseph was 17. He has this audacious dream. His brothers hate him for it. And what we know is this, is the brothers, they were able to rip off his coat, but they weren't able to rip off his character. I think the reason why God used Joseph and not Reuben, didn't use Judah, didn't use Levi, God used Joseph because Joseph, out of all the brothers, had character. How do we know he had character? Because we know that he didn't cry when he was in the pit. There's no record of him crying when he's falsely accused of rape by Potiphar's wife. There's no record of him crying the day he gets uh, appointed to the number two in command of the world. But we know the day that he begins to cry, and he was a crier, ladies and gentlemen. I read through the story again last night, and he cries eight times. It says, Joseph wept. He was a church crier. But he wasn't crying because he was uh, sad. He wasn't crying because he was bitter. He wasn't crying because he was angry. He wasn't crying because of injustice. The Bible says he wept because of the way that he loved people that he shouldn't have loved. That's character, ladies and gentlemen. This guy had an ability to actually love what no one else wanted to love. And I believe because of that, God trusted him with dreams. And here's what we know. God will let you interpret other people's dreams when God can actually speak to you your own dreams. Some of you never helped anybody else with their dreams because you never got close enough to God to get his dream for your life. You get close to him. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes that if you get close to God, in 5.3, it says a dream comes through much activity. There's something about getting close to God with action that causes dreams to spring up. I'm talking more about this in the weeks to come, but dreams were significant in the Bible. There's 21 stories in the Bible of dreams, six in the New Testament. Joseph, Jesus' stepfather, got three dreams. The wise men got a dream to return a different way. Pilate's wife got a dream to not harass Jesus. We know that God spoke in the language of dreams. Daniel had dream over and over and over again. Butlers and bakers explaining dreams. And here's what we know about Joseph is Joseph was ready for his dream because he was willing at the lowest, darkest moment of his life to help someone else's dream. He's locked up in a dungeon, false accusation of rape, serving out a life sentence, and he still cared to interpret a butler and a baker's dream. What type of selfless person? I would be wallowing in my self-pity. I don't belong here. But he says, why are you sad? They said, we have dreams and no one knows what they mean. I would tell you that we live in a world full of people that have dreams from God and they don't know what they mean. You know, what the, you know what the purpose of a dream is? It, it's, it has to do with the existence of your life. I actually think in many ways, you're, you're called to do in life whatever you have the most of God in, in your life. I told our college students, usually you get paid in life by the part of God that you have the most of. I have two daughters. They both kind of have my eyes. They both have my wife's good looks. Can I get an amen? I'm buying more guns even now. Come on. Help the pastor out. Scare off all the boys. But my daughters, they have my personality, they have their sense of humor, they're witty, they're funny, they're strong, right? And what I know is, is they have their mom in them, and they have their dad in them. You know what's funny about kids? Sometimes they don't look like you, but they act like you. Sometimes they look exactly like their dad, but they don't talk like them. Do you know what life is? Life is about knowing God, God loving you. And then you knowing, loving God, walking with him, helping other people know the God that knows them and loves them too. And here's what I know. You have the gift of empathy. You know what it is? The part of you that God gave you gifts in is the part of you you have the most of your heavenly father. So some of you, you have dad's eyes. Because you can see a homeless person on the street and it wounds your heart. Others of us will drive right by. We don't see it. But because you have our Heavenly Father's eyes, you see what we don't see. Others of you, you have Dad's hospitality gift. 
You'll welcome people into your home. You'll treat strangers like families. You have dad's heart to be hospitable. Others of you, you have this ability to teach like dad teaches. You start talking to people, they start getting educated. They start learning because you have that part of dad. You hear me today? And what I've learned is usually life, the dream God has for you, is usually connected to the part of God that you share the most of his divinity in. I can administrate, I can organize, I can sing, I can write, I can dance, I can, are you hearing me today? God has entrusted, all of us have something in us that looks like him. You weren't made in the image of AI, you were made in the image of God. And because of that, there is a part of you that's in him. And there's a part of you that's in him and there's a part of him that's in you. And what we know is that God will give you dreams to show you what the blueprint looks like. God gives dreams to warn us of things not to do. God gives us dreams that will convey what will happen in the future. In the Bible, God gave dreams to reveal the spiritual truths. He gave dreams to confirm a promise, to offer encouragement. He can confirm someone of a group or a thing of something they're supposed to do. Dreams were used to inform an enemy before there's destruction. He offered a person a gift from God. Solomon, what do you want me to do for you? He offered that invitation in a... In a dream, God spoke in dreams over and over. And one time, he warned a person that they would be punished for their sins in a dream. God will speak dreams. He'll give dreams. He's, and here's what we know is most of the time, we know we're not ready for God's dreams when, number one, it's still about us. I want you to write this down. First thing we know if we're going to be prepared for God's dreams is we have to deal with this, this elephant in the room called pride. And if you think we need to move on to the next point, I want you to slow down and lean in. Because usually the people that don't think they're proud are the ones that are proud. It's a tricky thing. When you think you're humble, you're probably not. It's kind of like bad breath. You're always the last one to know about it. I've learned this, that Joseph, he went through a test at 17, didn't graduate until he was 30. Which, FYI, there's actually, I think he should have been 28. But when he had the butler and the baker... And he interpreted their dreams. The one mistake that he made was that after he interpreted the butler's and the baker's dream, he actually did one more thing that he tried to self-promote himself. I actually believe if he just would have interpreted the dreams, I think that God would have called him out of that dungeon right away. But if you read the verse, it says that he told the butler, hey, um, when you get back in the, into the White House, tell the president about me. Tell him I'm innocent. Tell him I'm a good man. God did not need the butler's help to locate where an unjust man was being trapped. God knew exactly where to help him out. And the problem in our society is we like to self-promote ourselves. We like to sponsor our own post. We like to retweet our own, our own sentences. Uh, one of my mentors said that retweeting yourself is like high-fiving yourself in public. Come on. I know it's a part of the way the world works today. But I actually, I grew up in an era of time that you didn't invite yourselves to speak at conferences. You didn't call people and say, hey, can I speak at your church? In my day, when you were growing up, God had to open up the doors. I never invited myself to speak anywhere in the earth. And I've been to Australia 16 or 17 times. I've spoken at hundreds of churches all over the world. And it was never, hey, can you, uh, have you seen my, my material, my media packet that I've been promoting? I'm telling you that God knows where to find you when you're ready. Some of you aren't ready yet, and that's why God's not elevating you yet. God knows exactly where to find you when you're ready. But the problem is you're not ready when there's still pride that's on the throne. You know you're arrogant when you have to vocalize everything. Pastor, i got to tell you about my ministry. No, you don't. God will show me when it's right timing. Pastor, i got to tell you what my gifts are. Let me tell you how special I am. No, 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 it's all right. God will sh when it's your time to shine... God knows where to find you. We got too many people pushing their own business cards in the church. God knows where to find you, how to bless you. One of my, one of my friends, he's a, one of Reinhard Bonnke's spiritual sons, and he told Reinhard Bonnke, he said, Reinhard, I've been traveling with you the last 10 years. He goes, I don't have any connections in ministry. He said, you're telling me to go out and start my own evangelistic crusade? He goes, I don't have any donors. I don't have any friends that are pastors. I don't know anybody. And Reinhard Bonnke looked at him and he said, you know God. And if you know God, you have access to anything else in this world. 
I don't need someone to endorse me if God endorses me. Come on, can I get a good amen up in this place? I feel like preaching. Truth is, is there is pride in all of us. And I want you to this is not just for some people. You were born in a fallen condition called proud. We were born because of one Adam, his sin. One man's sin caused all to be born under condemnation. Romans chapter 5, you read the story. But through one man, his obedience, all of us have been pardoned of that condemnation. We know that we serve a God that actually is rich in mercy. But the truth is, is God will root out in our, in our character pride. Pride is rooted in insecurity. If pride is in your heart, insecurity is in your soul. And here's what we know about insecurity being in your soul. Insecurity is a liability with God dreams. Because insecure leaders will try to bring the praise that belongs to God to themselves. Insecure people have to tell everybody when it was their idea. Insecure people have to say, oh, I was, that was me. That organization thing, that was me. I wrote that song. I wrote that sermon. Oh, that was me. I was the one that put that project together. I was the reason why this went well today. Proud people always have to tell. And here's another fruit of being proud. If you interrupt people all the time, it's because what you think what you have to say is more important than what they're saying. It's going to get quiet up in the Presbyterian church for a second. But I've learned this, that the most, the most misquoted scripture, maybe in the Bible, is Proverbs 16, 18. Everyone always says, pride leads before the fall. And it doesn't read like that. It says pride goes before destruction. It says it's a haughty spirit that goes before a fall. The Bible says in James 4, 6 that God resists the proud. You know what the word resist means? We always think of it as a negative thing. I want you to think about it as a, you as a parent going, I'm not giving you the keys. I'm resisting you from driving until I know you're not going to hurt anybody or yourself. I'm going to resist my 15-year-old daughter from driving until I know that she has the skills and the character to do it well. Amen. Do you know what God does with pride? He'll say, no, no, you're still arrogant. You still think that it's about you. I remember talking to a young musician in our church. He goes, I don't know what it is, Pastor Mark. I just like doing my own music because when they chant my name, I love it. I'm like, so did Lucifer. Yeah. Lucifer was all about people chanting his name. He was like Destiny's Child. Say my name, say my, right? <laughs> all about it. All about it. Why? Because... Because hell wants you to brag about your own name. And here's what I know in the kingdom of God. In God's kingdom, it doesn't matter who gets the credit as long as God gets the glory. I think the reason why he's going to entrust much to Ocean's Church is I could care less who gets the credit as long as God gets the glory. We did one of the largest water baptisms in American history. We didn't even tell anybody about it except our own church. God said, I want you to organize it. I want you to fund it. And don't put your name on any of it. Next year, Pentecost Sunday, May 19th, we're going to do the largest baptism in world history. We're going to unite the church of not Southern California, all of California. And then in 2025, when you think it couldn't get any better, we're going to do Baptize America. And there's going to be hundreds of churches from the East Coast to the West Coast. Let me just blow your little mind for a second. And when you think it couldn't get any better than that, in 2026, guess what we bought this week? We bought the domain to baptize Europe, baptize Africa, baptize South America. Believe it or not, I got the domain to baptize the earth. Because I just thought, man, this ball gets rolling. Who knows where it stops? Eye hasn't seen. Ear hasn't heard. What God has in store for those that love him. The problem why most of us can't be used is we want our name on everything. I don't care who gets the credit as long as God gets the honor. And the reason why God's going to raise up some, some, some people here is because I could care less who gets the credit. I was meeting with a business guy this week. He goes, hey, look, I want to sponsor college students. I want to sponsor this marriage conference coming up. I want to sponsor this. I want to sponsor that. It's, look, just give me one favor, Pastor Mark. I don't want anyone to know about it. And I'm like... That smells like dad. Dad's like that. Dad's a guy that's like, I'll do it in secret. And I'll let God reward me. God's my rewarder. We live in a generation that's at the opposite. We want to be seen doing good, and we don't do anything good behind the scenes. Get quiet up in here. I'm going to keep preaching like I feel it, though, today. 
Here's what I learned about insecurity. If you remember that you're a child of God, it kills insecurity. Most of you are insecure because you don't realize that God made you. God loves you. God made you the way that you are. And he'll actually, he'll cause you to be born again into his nature. And when you're born into his nature, here's the good news. You are a child of God. You know my daughters have security in? They have security in this idea that I'm both of their dads. And I love both of my daughters. And there's no insecurity like, well, Kenzie's more of a Francie than Chloe is. No, they're both my girls. And some of you are insecure because you don't realize you're God's kid. So what kills insecurity is your identity as a child of God. Here's the other side of the coin. What kills pride? Here's what kills pride. Never forgetting where God found you. Some of you are so braggadocious. Well, I've, I've gone to seminary and I know the, I speak Greek and Hebrew and I'm very smart and I'm educated. And I, got, I got a big house and a beautiful wife. I'm just, I've, I've made it. And you don't realize that God is the one that gave you your brain. God gave you, you had a good family? Who gave you the family? Well, I had a terrible family, but I made my way out of it. Who gave you the persistence? Who gave you the mental fortitude not to give up? Well, I wasn't living for God. Well, he still made you the way that you are. That ornery resilience in you, God gave you that. And some of you are taking credit for God's work. That's called plagiarism. And no one likes to plagiarize her. That's what Romans talks about. Romans says that the world denies God and they see him everywhere in existence. When you see the goodness of God in your life and you don't acknowledge that he's real, you're plagiarizing God. Sorry, I'm fired up today. Many people don't realize that it is insecurity that is robbing you and that's what's creating pride in your life. We get rid of insecurity when we surrender. We say, God, I am your child so I can be secure. But... I remember where you found me, so I'm not going to be arrogant. You know you're proud when you have to vocalize things. I believe Mary and Joseph had something in common. They were both teenagers when God spoke to them in dramatic ways. What do we know about Joseph? He was 17 when he got this huge dream. But I think Mary actually could have blown Joseph out of the water. Imagine if they lived in the same time period and Joseph's like bragging to Mary. Well, God showed me the sun, moon, and stars bowing to me, Mary. And Mary goes, I birthed God. That's a one-up line right there. Now, listen, what we know about Mary, I think the reason why God elevated Mary, some come on the keys, most finished, is that Mary actually, it says in Luke 2.19, that she, look, she had wise men give her gold. Scholars say that it wasn't just the, the ministry of women that supported Jesus when he traveled the world for three years. They said it was Mary stewarding the gold that the wise man brought when he was a little kid. We know that Mary at her, in the delivery room had shepherds bumping in there, going angels, heavenly choirs told us to come in here and said the Messiah was born. Mary knew she was raising God. But you know what Mary didn't do? She didn't brag about it. Come on in, guys. Come on in. I'll tell you a story. So I birthed the Lord. I mean, I'm not, his words, not mine. I raised him. Kind of made him this perfect kid, you know? I've been raising the perfect kid last 33 years. Not a big deal, but, you know, I was his mom. You know, we don't read everywhere, anywhere in Scripture about Mary, is arrogance. And I think the reason why God put one down, Joseph, at 17, and said, I'm going to put you through the university of character. And if you can overcome pride, I can trust you with more. You know, one of the things that gets, gets, gets rid of pride, number two, it's the pit test. It's when you go through, because the truth is, in life sometimes, pits are, it says in, in Genesis chapter 37, verse 24, that the pit was empty and there was no water there. The pit is what his family put him in. Some of you were betrayed by your family. So you were betrayed by brothers, sisters, mothers, siblings. And the truth is, you've been betrayed and you're in an empty, no food, no water, dry place. It's a pit. Forrest Gump says pit happens sometimes, right? And when you're in pit, in a pit season that you don't want to be in, 
I actually think in the beginning of that pit, Joseph probably complained to God and said, God, my family's so screwed up. It's their fault. I bet you at the beginning of that pit, he goes, it's their fault I'm in this pit. How dare them for being so jealous of me? But I think somewhere along the way, maybe after a few hours, I think he probably got on his knees and goes, God, maybe there's something in me that was arrogant. They didn't just hate me because of my dreams. They hated me because of my... It was the arrogance of my words that pushed my family away. The good news is God could use terrible things. The devil's so bad, though, so satanic. We know that his brothers were so engrossed in this sin plot that his dad believed that his son was dead for 22 years. You know what they did? They fabricated the scene of the crime. They took his coat of many colors. They got some goat blood, put it on the jacket. They came home. They didn't even say th that your son's dead. They brought false evidence. And they said this. Is this your son's coat? They never said he was dead. They actually suggested a lie that was believed for 22 years. And I feel like today, some of you have been believing a lie for 10 years, 2 years, 5 years, maybe it's 22 years. That something's dead that God can revive. Maybe it's not dead at all. Maybe you just don't have, you haven't had a rest rest restorative moment yet. I'm telling you, there is a God in heaven that raises dead things. I can't imagine how sadistic the brothers had to be to listen to their father cry in the other room of the house for 22 years that's what sin will do sin will make you stay committed to something that hurts everybody else because your heart is calloused and I believe that God will use the pits of your life to remind you that God I don't want any pride in my heart I actually personally believe it was when Joseph surrendered his pride that he got out of that pit he got out of it I'm going to talk more about next week what happened after we got out of that pit. But for the sake of time, I want to point your attention to this idea today that it says in chapter 37, verse 22, that Reuben, someone say it with me, Reuben. Reuben was the firstborn of the family. Someone say it again, Reuben. Reuben told his brothers that day, shed no blood. Don't kill Joseph. Just cast him into this pit. Cast him in the pit in the wilderness and do not lay a hand on him. Watch what he says that he, Reuben, might deliver him, firstborn, out of their hands and bring him back to his father. I want you to catch this today in your heart. Reuben, I believe, was the firstborn. And in this context, he's a Christophany of what it is, to, what Jesus would do for us. You know, Jesus, he's the firstborn, Colossians says, of all creation. And you know what Jesus does for all of us when it pertains to life and dreams? He's the one like Reuben that says, uh, I'm going to get you out of the pit and I want to bring you back to the Father. Do you know what your dream's supposed to do? It's supposed to allow God to get you out of the pit and bring you back to the Father. Let me take it a step further. God wants to raise you up to get other people out of their pits and bring them back to the Father. Why does God want to bless your marriage? Because there's people that are in pits in their marriages right now. And you can't get them out of their pit until you let God get you out of your pit. Bring them back to the Father. We're struggling financially. You can't get someone else out of their pit if you're in your own pit. You can't help people if you're in the same hole they're in. You one of those prosperity preachers? No, I, I believe that, that, listen, the problem with prosperity is this, is we've seen extremes of it, and we go, well, if I name it, claim it, and I blab it and grab it, and if I sow money to this, this tele-evangelist, tele they're going to give me some oil from Israel, and I'm going to get a jet and a Rolls Royce in 24 hours. We've seen such ridiculous extreme that we've made an equal mistake of saying that God doesn't take care of his kids. But the Bible is clear on this, that if you were to boil Christianity down, it's a Genesis 37 verse 24 moment that God wants to use you to help others get out of their pit and bring them back to the Father. That's what my friend Ross has been doing. He's been bringing people out of the pit and bringing them back 
to the Father. Some of you, you haven't been dreaming with God because you're not living your life or your vocation to get out of the pit and go to the Father. Some of you love your pits too much. I've kind of got used to my pit. Some of you are naming your pits. This is just the pit of my eating disorder. This is my pornography pit. This is just my, you know, it's my low conviction pit. This is my my alcoholism pit. Look, I, I love the Father, but I just want to hang out in the pit a little longer. And you'll never help others get out of their pit until you let God get you out of your pit. So important today. He wanted to deliver his younger brother and bring him back to the Father. This is what Christ does for us. Jesus went to the pit so that we don't have to live there. He will deliver you and restore you to the Father. Can I get a good amen? So today, you know, I think it's important. I want to wrap this up with this idea. You know, it's interesting. I believe that when we live for God's dream, and I'll summarize it for the the weeks that are coming, but here's what I want to say of where we're going in the weeks to come. God's dream for your life, I believe, will make people say, like they did to Joseph in Genesis 47, 25, your life in some way saved mine. I believe that when we are fully alive to God's dream, you won't just save yourself. And by the way, God saves you. But your life and your walk with God will actually be responsible for saving other people. Let me say it another way. Your life becomes the answer to somebody else's prayer. And when your life isn't the answer to someone else's prayer, you're probably not living for God's dream. We have too many Christians in America that are only living for their family and not living for the family of God. Lord, raise me up to be the answer to somebody else's prayer. That's my prayer. God, they said, Joseph, you are so dang wise. Do you know that he spent 17 years with his father? And he spent the last 17 years with his father. The last 17 years of Jacob's life, he was with Joseph in Egypt. And we know that he was was ordained as prime minister at 30. He was 39 when he got reacquainted with his father. He was 38, I believe, when famine hit the land of Egypt. He was 44 when the famine was over, I think it was. He spent, listen, seven years in famine, but he was so good when times were good that when the times got worse, his influence got stronger. This is what God's dream in your life will do. It doesn't matter if the world gets darker, you'll shine brighter. The more severe the famine was, the more powerful Joseph became. It says at one point, they said, look, we'll give you all of our money. Give us what you've saved up. Give us the seed. Here's all of our money. And when they ran out of money, they said, give us seed. We'll give you the livestock. And when they ran out of livestock, they said, look, we ran out of livestock to give you. We ran out of money. We'll give you our land. You know what's crazy? Because of the master's dream in Joseph's life, the people of a wicked kingdom, they gave the king their money, their vocation, their land, and ultimately their lives. I feel like preaching here today. Do you know what God's dream will do to Joseph's? It'll cause even a wicked state to give the master in heaven their money. That's revival. I'll give God my money. I'll give God my livestock. I'll give God my vocation. I'll give God my land. I'll give God my life. That's revival. That's when we live for the master's dream. Stand to your feet. I'm finished. I feel something in here today. God is preparing you. But listen, the only person, look at me really close to you right now. The only person that can rip you off from God's dream is you. I want to remind you, no devil in hell can keep you out of God's destiny. But if you refuse to let him get rid of the the pride in you, you refuse to get a, you get a bad attitude, you get thrown in the pit, start blaming everybody else. Some of you got to stop blaming everybody else and say, Lord, if it's in me, David prayed, Lord, test me, try me and know my anxieties. See if there be any wicked way in me. This is his prayer. And lead me in the way of everlasting. That's what we're going to do here today. Amen. So grab your, grab your neighbor's sweaty hand real quick. We're family here today. Grab that sweaty thing. I want you to pray for your neighbor on your left and on your right. Just pray this prayer. Say, Jesus, today, 
we're asking make us make them ready for your dreams that can change nations lord today let their life be evidence that god speaks that god lives let it be said of them like joseph we can't find anybody better than them that has the spirit of god living inside of them i pray that their friends family employees and bosses would know that they're all blessed because of them that's what joseph did so bless them now with your dreams your visions and hear me goshen church i feel like god is going to make us a dreaming church some of you you're going to dream about businesses you can let go of their hand you're going to dream about marriages there's ministries that are going to be birthed but listen this is a joseph master dreamer church maryland there is dreams and i just hear the lord saying that you're never too old to dream with god you know it says on the day of pentecost that the young man will see visions and the old man they'll dream dreams I just feel like, how many believe that God could give you a dream today, a vision today? Brand, I just feel like, right now, Brand, I see a dream and a vision. I see it over Brighton today, a dream and a vision. A preacher to the nations. Dreams, visions. So here's our prayer today. We're asking God, prepare us. Remember what prep time is? It's the time duration between preparing everything and getting the recipe ready to cook. Here's the good news, it took, it took Joseph 13 years to get prepared, but guess what, his meal lasted 80 years. I think the biggest disservice that preachers do is we talk about the 13 years of hell and we don't talk about the 80 years of reigning. We obey God, we'll go through some tests, we'll go through some challenges, but listen to me, we'll come out on the other side like pure gold. And God will use us for four decades, five decades, six decades to be a voice to the nations. So Lord, I pray right now that you would fill this church with master dreamers in Jesus' name. Last two things we do today, if you're here, I want to pray for you. How many of you feel like, God, I want to give you permission to get rid of any pride? Just give God a wave offering right now. God, any weeds of insecurity, any pride, any slander. Some of you have been in pits and it's dry, it's lonely and you've been angry and you've been grieving. And I love the fact that he says in Genesis 45, 16, he says, don't be angry, don't grieve, God brought me here. God sent me before you to save many. Genesis 50 says, it wasn't you that brought me here, you meant it for evil against me, but God meant it for good to save many. My thesis is that God will give this church a dream to save many. God will give you a dream to save many. God will give your, your family a dream to save many. I feel it. Fadi Kim, you're going to save many. God is doing something, Paul and Lisa, save many. Come on, JJ, save many. I believe you're raising up, God, those that will be a part of the saving many in Jesus' mighty name. So last thing we do today, last quick two things. If you're here today, I believe God is healing backs and spines. He's healing scoliosis. Someone in here, you have double vision. I believe God would heal your eyes today. There's someone you have some sort of like a rare condition in the back of your eye. It's like a shadow type of cataract in the back of your eye. God is healing it. Right eye, I believe it is today, right now. I pray from the back of the room to the front, those watching online. If you need a healing in your physical body, or I called it out already, I want you to lift your hand right now. We'll be out of here in just two minutes, three minutes. Lift your hands. God, I believe that you are a healer, and I believe that you can heal me. Lift your hands right now. That's you, that's you, that's you. Father, I pray you'd see every hand that's lifted, and I pray as we lay hands on the sick that they would recover starting right now. Ocean's Church, you know the drill. Find someone with their hand up next to you. Put your hand on their shoulder right now. We all need prayer sometimes. We all need prayer sometimes. We all need prayer sometimes. If your hand's on them, come on, just believe God. Say, Jesus, we bind the spirit of infirmity. Close your eyes. He's here. We bind any sickness disease or anything demonic we release the peace of God 
that heals, saves, delivers. We release the Holy Spirit to heal, to save, to deliver right now in Jesus Christ's name. I just believe that this week, this month, you're going to see notable, tangible, medically verified miracles. And if you believe it, come on, shout a good amen. Last thing I do, I'll give it up. Get you out of here today. Don't sit down just yet. We'll get you out of here just a moment. If you're here today, you prayed these prayers, but you're like, Mark, to be honest, I walked in these tents not living my life for Jesus. But I don't want to leave these tents the same way. The truth is, today, I want to rededicate my life to God. Or for the very first time, I want to say, Jesus, I'm done living for me. I want to live for you. I love what Dietrich Bonhoeffer said. Such a cool quote. He said this phrase, that our lives, I'll quote, I want to make sure I quote him properly here. He says, your life as a Christian should make non-believers question their disbelief in God. I love this quote. Your life as a Christian should make non-believers question their disbelief in God. If you're not living like that, but you say, I want to be all in, I'm going to ask everyone to close their eyes. No one's looking around. This is between you and God. I'm just going to have you raise your hand. I'm not going to have you come forward. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm just going to count every hand that goes up. Every week, 20, 30, 40 hands go up. And every week, God is populating heaven, changing lives. If that's you today, you say, Mark, I want to give my life to God today. I'll rededicate my life. You can put your hands up. I'll give you three seconds. One, hands go up all over. Two, more hands going up. I need every hand that's going to go up to go up right now, real high. Three, real high. That's me. One, two, keep it up. Four, three, five, six, seven. Real high, 8, 9, 10, 11, real high, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, yeah, real high, 19, 20, 21, 22, real high, 23, real high, 24, real high, I see in the back back, 25, awesome, man, at least, wait, might be 27, at least 25, maybe 27, 28, that's I can see, if you're online, right heart, H-E-A-R-T, here's what I know, listen to me, everyone look at me. Your dad made you with a dream in mind. You're not an accident. My parents said I was an accident. You might have surprised mom and dad. But I promise you, God has never met an accident. Let me say one more thing. God has never met someone he didn't love. And he's here right now. Just close your eyes. We're going to pray. Those 27, 28, 30 people, man, there's a lot of people today. If you didn't raise your hand, you're supposed to. There's three more of you. I didn't raise my hand, but I was supposed to. I was too scared to raise my hand. Everyone's eyes are closed right now. You missed the bus the first time, but you're like, I might have a heart attack because my heart is beating out of my chest. God is saying, don't miss the bus. Raise it right now. I'll give, you, I'll give you a second chance. I didn't raise it, but I was supposed to. There's one. Thank you. I didn't raise it, but I was supposed to. Real high. There's two. Thank you, my friend. Thank you, my friend. There's one more, I think. One more, one more, one more three. Thank you. I see in the back. Awesome. That's 30. All right. Pray this prayer. Ocean, say, Jesus, I invite you right now into my life. Would you forgive me all of my mistakes? I give you my guilt. I give you my shame. I give you my insecurity and even my pride. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Guide my life. Give me a love for your word, your kingdom, and a desire to pray. Last couple things. Say, Lord, I ask you for a church and for friends that know you better than I do. In Jesus Christ's name, my life is yours. And someone that's fired up said a good old-fashioned amen. I'm excited for this series. It's going to be an awesome week.